welcome back and sorry about that short cutoff but we're back and I have a couple more things I want you to see you can see it better there you go isn't that neato what a fun thing for Lent huh it's got a heart in the center uh, kind of vintage nail and string art so that's available and then I wanted you to see kind of a modern uh, lamp and maybe it's prettier from a distance. It's blue-green. It's got all kinds of different colors. And um, I'm going to turn its light out and turn the other one on so you can see the exterior. Oh, there you go. That's better, isn't it? I just needed to turn that one on. But isn't that a fun little lamp? Like a tube of colored glass. Remember, we are giving to Covenant House to help get kids off the streets and stop human trafficking. All right. We are going back to our birthdays and saints and then say goodbye. And remember, I'm having a wine tasting each evening this week for Wines for Humanity. Mega week, it's going to contribute to Covenant House, what I just mentioned to end human trafficking, and help get kids off the street. A wonderful organization. So please consider purchasing some fine art or come by and have a taste of wine and purchase some wine. All right, our artist, which is... Elizabeth Barrett Browning and she she was born March 6th 1806 in Coxhoe Hall Kello Durham and she's a poet a translator and a writer so my contest too is for creative writing as long as it fits on the page and is uh, 12 to 14 font. Uh, we are going to have a look at it and I'll put the description of the contest below and please check that out. Please enter. It's only three dollars a piece and you can enter three times in each contest. We're just going to talk a little bit about the poetry tonight. So Elizabeth Barrett Browning is arguably a finer poet than her most famous husband, Robert Browning. Perhaps to some, you know. Her work expresses her humane and liberal point of view, and her sonnets from the Portuguese has a place amongst the finest collections of love poems in Western literature. And we actually have one of her sonnets, number 43, which opens with, and you're probably going to recognize this, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. And this has been described as many an opening at a wedding. Oh, three, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height. My soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every days most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints 
I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Isn't that beautiful? Elizabeth Barrett Browning, popular in the Victorian era, popular in Britain and the United States during her lifetime and frequently anthologized after her death. Her work received renewed attention following the feminist scholarship of the 1970s and 1980s and greater recognition of women writers in English. She was the eldest of 12 children and she wrote poetry from the age of 11. Her mother's collection of her poems forms one of the largest extant collections of juvenilia by any English writer. At 15, she became ill, suffering intense head and spinal pain for the rest of her life. Later in life, she also developed lung problems, possibly tuberculosis. She took laudanum for the pain from an early age, which is likely to have contributed to her frail health. In the 1840s, Elizabeth was introduced to literary society through her distant cousin and patron, John Kenyon. Her first adult collection of poems was published in 1838, and she wrote prolifically from 1841 to 1844, producing poetry, translation, and prose. She campaigned for the abolition of slavery, and her work helped influence reform in child labor legislation. Her prolific output made her a rival to Tennyson as a candidate for the Poet Laureate on the death of Wordsworth. So, wow. Hmm? She was attracted to Robert Browning and he was attracted to her from her volume of poems in 1844, which brought her much success. So they began to correspond and the courtship began and marriage was carried out in secret for fear of her father's disapproval. Well, that's a shame. And actually true though, following the wedding, she was indeed disinherited by her father. In 1846, the couple moved to Italy, where she lived for the rest of her life. They had a son known as Penn. Yes, that's right, P-E-N, they named him. And he devoted himself to painting until his eyesight began to fail later in life. So Elizabeth's work had a major influence on prominent writers of the day, and she still has much influence, including uh, back then the American poets Edgar Allan Poe and Emily Dickinson. And she has a wonderful collection, so please check out her poetry. I'm going to read you a poem of mine in hopes that you will enter my contest. And this is called Josephine Baker. When I discovered Josephine, I was really full swing into my roller skate street dancing. And she was an inspiration. I read her biography. And I was so thrilled about how she loved children and she adopted many, many children. So here's my poem to Josephine Baker. Dancer extraordinaire, found stepping for children, many, many children. She took them in, sent them out, one with the child, this mother of adoption, as our Abba, as many as she could, her motherhood boundless. Like her art, free-flying expression, capturing joy, life. Like the wind, the oxygen, not to stop blowing.
not to stop flowing, to give and give for little ones to live. Eat, pray, work, play, on and on. This dance of life on into the next, the next pulse at the beat, the breath, on with the music that shall not end, again and again. She danced, she mothered, she loved another child, another song, again and again. Encore and amen. Encore, amen. Thank you. And I'm going to kick back and talk about our saint. So you too join me. St. Thomas Aquinas. And I picked him because he passed away in March. He was born in 1225 and he passed away on March 7th, 1274. He was an Italian Dominican friar and priest, an influential philosopher and theologian, and a jurist in the tradition of scholasticism from the county of Aquino in the kingdom of Sicily. He was known as the Angelic Doctor, born of a wealthy family at Rocco Secca near Naples in Italy, he disappointed his family by joining a poor order of preachers in 1244 that followed the rule of Dominic and were therefore known as the Dominicans. In 1245, he began to study in France with Albertus Magnus, whose favorite pupil he became. In 1248, he accompanied Albert to Cologne, Germany. From there, Thomas returned to Paris, where he became known as a great teacher and theologian. He spent some time in Rome as a papal advisor, returned to Paris to teach for a period, and then returned to Naples to found a house of studies in 1272. In 1274, on the way to a church council at Lyons, France, he took sick, and he died at the young age of 49. His works show him to be a brilliant lecturer clear thinker, and an Aristotelian. In an age which was uncomfortable with the notion that the universe could be known apart from revelation, he pioneered the use of the Greek philosophy that featured the power of reason to demonstrate that God and his universe could be understood by reason guided by faith. He was the composer of several memorable religious hymns, such as O Salutaris Hostia, which we sing at Exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn. And it's familiar to most modern worshipers for this reason. His extensive writings explored the relationship between the mind of man and the mind of God. And his synthesis of knowledge relating to this joining of intellect and religious belief, entitled the Summa Theologica, earned him a lasting reputation among scholars and religious alike. Thomas also continued in the spirit of Albert the Great to lay a foundation of legitimacy for the Christian study of natural phenomena that allowed Christian Europe to proceed to the initial stages of the scientific revolution. Pope Leo XIII declared scholasticism in 1879 in the encyclical and Patri to be the official Roman Catholic philosophy. Aquinas's five proofs for the existence of God might be summarized as follows. Number one, the unmoved mover. Whatever is moved is moved by something. And since an endless regress is not possible, a prime mover is required. Number two, the first cause. Every result has a cause, and since an endless regress is impossible, there must be a first cause. Number three, the ultimate necessity. Essentially a repeat of reason two. There must be a source for all consequences which follow. Number four, perfect source. All perfection in the world requires, at its source, 
and ultimate perfection. And then number five, purpose. Even lifeless things have a purpose, which must be defined by something outside themselves, since only living things can have an internal purpose. And so there you have a short description of St. Thomas Aquinas. He was so known for his reasoning mind and he thought that that is where we operate since we are intellectual beings. It begins in our intellect which then moves the will and there are some that think that the will is primary then the intellect but St. Thomas, and I tend to agree, thought the intellect was primary and you can deny your own in intellect and we do it every day by the way we sin and pick up a vice. We know it's not healthy. We know it's against the natural law. We know it's against God and our neighbor and we tend to, um, if we get into a habit of it, we tend to fall into this vice and it's often our intellect which will tell our conscience, you know, actually this is not right. God has told me it's not right. The church has told me it's not right. My inner heart and soul and mind is telling me it's really not right. I know it to be. It's like St. Paul who said the law is written in our heart, on our heart. So anyway, what a fantastic saint. Please discover him for yourself. And let's pray to him that he will intercede for us in these trying times, these modernist days where um, much is about feelings and how we feel and, and not so much about the truth, which is really primary. And there's your primary source which is the sacred scriptures where Jesus said, I am the truth, the life, and the way. And whoever follows me will have the light of life. Amen. Okay. Thank you, St. Thomas, for interceding for us. And we have some birthdays in this first week or 10 days of March that we're going to celebrate. And I have a key lime pie here. So let's light the candle. And if you're local here tomorrow on your way home, take the long way home and stop by and have a sip of wine with me and help Covenant House get kids off the street and stop human trafficking. All right, we have... March 2nd, happy birthday to Lynn and Eva, Ginny and Spencer. On the 4th, we have Suzette. On the 5th, we have Mara and Oliver. On the 6th, we have Terry and Keith. On the 7th, we have Allison and Dan. 
and Michael. On the eighth, we have Mary. On the ninth, Mary Beth and Victoria, Bill. And on the tenth, we have Ken. And on the 11th, we have Maria, Melanie, Michael, and Paul. So happy birthday to you, first part of March. And this goes out to Christine 